Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. Today, we are pleased to have Stephanie Yee, a pricing expert and associate partner at Bain Consulting. You know, profitable growth, I think, is really important, and, and dynamic pricing, I think, is, in general, I think, in distribution, uh, it's going more and more towards dynamic pricing, right? Depending on, there's certain sub-industries that are more towards that already, and, and yeah. some that are less. But one of the things that helps you do is the combination of dynamic pricing and being able to segment your customers and products and 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 optimize you know provide optimized pricing guidance into into your you know into your customers really is a, a way that helps enable profitable growth for you know by making sure the deals that you're negotiating are as, as profitable as possible and then you can also make recommendations in terms of like cross sell upsell opportunities i know that we've talked about that in the past uh and so can you tell me about like your experience there in terms of helping to enable profitable growth at, at distributors or other companies? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a couple of different ways. Um, so there's, there's some, and not all, not all customers are in the same starting base, right? So you're going to have, once you start to get a better view of your customers and their profitability and how much share you have, you start to build and understand then a view of what are the customers that are at the optimal, you know, Baskets, like we have most of their share and we're, we've got great margins on them. Well, for those kind of com for those kind of customers, you're thinking about retention. Like how do right. I keep the customer happy and all those kinds of things. But then you'll have these other kind of customer segments that are, you know, we've got a lot of business with, you know, so we've got high share, but maybe the profitability isn't great, you mm -hmm. know? And so how do you think about that? you know, maybe thinking about mixed changes or raising pricing on certain items, you know, if they make sense and all of those kinds of things. But how do you think about like improving the overall profitability of that customer without losing kind of your share in, in, in that customer? And then there's some other ones where, you know, you might be highly profitable, but actually their share potential is much higher than what we currently have. And that's when you start to think about not everything is always about raising prices. You start to think about like, well, you know, what are some give get kind of programs where we can increase the share and total mm -hmm. profit dollars with that customers, but maybe we lower price some other things or we do bundling or, you know, or some other tactics to basically try to grow our overall dollars and share with that customer. And so, um, you know, as we've done work with different clients, we try to understand, um, you know, build out that view around profitability of the customer, what's their share potential. And then you think about pricing as a strategic lever for how can I use that to grow overall gross profit dollars with the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the kind of distribution centric models around that segmentation that we've used before, and we were actually introduced by one of our distribution clients, is this idea of customer stratification, which is looking at, you know, the customers and kind of segmenting them a along a few different levers. One is uh, loyalty. So are, are they, you know, loyal to you? Are they buying across? a lot of different uh, yeah. of your categories are, is it growing or shrinking, things like that, then how much purchasing power do they have, right? So how big are they? How, what's the total wallet that, that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. How much it costs you to serve them? So we talked about the freight cost and then what is their profitability and how is that trending? Um, have, have you, I, I thought that book was really pragmatic. We actually hadn't ever implemented, this was about five years ago, I think four or five years ago. Um, and we, we actually kind of developed, you know, uh, I got, I bought the book and I read it and I was like, wow, this is okay. It's really pragmatic the way it outlines it. And we en ended up implementing that along with one of our customers and they got really good results out of it. Um, so uh, do you have, I don't know if, if when you look at segmentation and, and you look at, you know, distribution, are there other approaches that you've used? Can you talk, I mean, because one of the keys to price optimization, I'd say actually the key is really, um, understanding how to segment your customers and products and and doing that in a way that's going to reflect the the strategy and the direction and being able to flex that and, and be agile with it at, as well. So um, can you just talk, talk about your experience there on, on the segmentation side? Yeah, yeah. I would say that what you described in terms of understanding importance of a customer to a company makes total sense. I think we're uh, most distributors that I've seen struggle is understanding, you know, the full potential because it's not um, in a lot of these industries that data is just not very readily available around like the total purchase size as it is in, in some other industries where you can easily buy like third party data to understand what that 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 is. And right. so what I've seen over time is that, 
you know, more and more companies understanding that potential is is really important, not just the size that we currently have, but what mm-hmm. they're capable of buying and understanding what that market opportunity is and, and working through the analytics of it to, to figure that out. And, you know, Bain, um, you know, has a great um, partner that we, a tool set that we use to, to help folks figure that out. Um, I think the, the other part of, um, segmentation, I would say is, I would say that I tend to think about um, segmentation in a lot of different ways based on the use case as well. So when I think about um, how I want to think about customer segments in terms of understanding their buying patterns, I would use different criteria for how I would think about those segments. And so in those, in those, um, segments where I'm thinking about cross-sell, upsell, things like that, I'm looking more around like purchasing behavior segments, you know? And so I do think that um, segmentation should be fit for purpose in terms of the use case that you're trying to solve for, because I think you'll find that different levers matter in different situations and you might want to group customers uh, together depending on, on, on those. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the the way that you segment customers for even, you know, certain product categories might be different than others, but or the way that you recommend uh, what they should be buying might be different than the way that you segment for them for the purposes of how you price them, right? So totally agree. And value buyers versus like, you know, price buyers and all that kind of stuff. There's also to some attitudinal things that can also come into play for how you think about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then what is their you know, procurement strategy and tactics? And are they, you know, um, like poker players, are they going to bluff you in, into believing that they're a price buyer when they're really a value buyer and that whole thing? Yeah. Um, well, but also, too, like you just said, like if you're if you're a procurement buyer and you get you know, incentivized on a large rebate, you know, showing that you can you've saved this much, it's very different than the the end, yeah, you know, the person that might be buying from the location who's not in the procurement organization, who's looking at the bill that they're paying and in, in trying to make decisions on pricing. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, definitely in our, in our own negotiations, oftentimes, you know, when you get, you have a certain, uh, you know, relationship with the business and, and IT people that might be driving a project of ours, right? And then you get kind of handed off to the procurement person and they have a whole different set of boxes <laughs> that they need to yeah. check, right? <laughs> And then you, so the key is to understand what are those boxes and then how can I, uh, you know, create a win-win where we can both get our boxes checked and I'm not giving away the things that are key to me, but I'm, I'm giving you the things that you need to get to, you know, look good in front of your manager, whatever it is at the end of the year, right? right. Or drive the the change for your organization. So speaking of change, I I think, um, you know, I had um, last year, uh, we had pretty early on in the podcast, I had uh, Chuck Davenport and Paco Jimenez from Bain on and we talked about, uh, digital transformation. And so we were working together on one of uh, a joint client of, of Bain and price effects um, to help enable, um, there was an overall digital transformation pro- uh, project that that Bain was, was enabling there uh, and pricing was part of that, right? And so we talked a lot about, you know, digital transformation of the quote to cash process. And uh, it was more holistic than just price setting. It was price setting, negotiation, you know, promotions, off invoiced uh, incentives. And so, you know, we talked about kind of what are the keys in doing that and what what's, uh, you know, the the benefit of doing it and, and kind of the process and everything. Um, I, I don't know how much of uh, you've been exposed to kind of digital transformation of pricing specifically. It sounded like from your background, you had a lot of kind of digital transformation experience early on in your career. And then you were definitely building out the pricing and revenue management function when when you're at Cisco. Um, can you just talk about your experience maybe in, in digital transformation, your perspective there and the value of doing it? And also, you know, what what's the the risk in not doing it right for for companies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, you know, as we were building out the, the pricing and revenue management work, we definitely technology had to be an enabler. I mean, in, in the. Well, in, in the place that I was at, we had thousands and thousands of, of sellers. So whatever we had to do had to get at scale. Um, and it's very difficult to do that without technology. And you can't, it, it's difficult to be agile without it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's difficult to make things easier actually for the end user to, to do without. I think, you know, it, it's pretty exciting because, you know, we at the time, um, you know, this marketplace has changed so much, you know, 
with all of the cloud-based software that's now readily available, it's just much faster and a lot easier to start, you know, with a digital transformation. I mean, I, we always kind of recommend at, as Bain, you know, as we work with our business customers, always to think about like, let's first understand what you're trying to solve for as a business. You know, and, and let's make sure you're clear on what are the business changes you want to make. And then let's make sure the technology enables it. But gone are the days I feel like where your option was, hey, you know, it's going to take you a year and a half, you know, to get rolled out with something right. that can really scale at enterprise level. Mm -hmm. And I think now there's a much lower entry cost point to get started with thinking about how you enable things at scale from proof of concept all the way to end state. And so um, I think, you know, in my experience, you know, um, we kind of went, I've done things that are more maybe the longer route, you mm -hmm. know, uh, but I think I'm excited for all of the options now where, you know, if I think back, if we would have had some of the capabilities that are available now, we could have shortcutted, you know, yeah. some of the time it took for us to really deploy and implement things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think too, you know, the application of um, advanced analytics in places where there are you have a transactionally rich data set can mm -hmm. also create a ton of value in terms of you know digital transformation and unlocks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always talk about organizational attention span and the fact that you know it's getting shorter and shorter, and that you know the if you can't produce value within you know three to six months. You're, you're losing, right? You're, you're losing attention, you're losing, uh, you know, supporters. Um, so we really, uh, and luckily, because we are 100% cloud based, we can, you know, move at that kind of mm -hmm. speed and deliver that kind of incremental value to organizations. Um, and and yeah. even pay for the whole investment within the first yeah. year. So if you can come up with something that, you know, pays for itself within one year, you're, you're doing pretty well these days. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. So I was going to say, I think that's absolutely right. You know, um, most of our clients are exactly what you described. You know, they want to install long term capabilities, but they want to make money that pay, you know, right from the get to try to pay for these programs at, as, as they journey through. So completely agree. Yeah. So so one thing you also talked about with the digital transformation and one thing that occurred to me that we haven't talked about yet is we talked about kind of some of the changes with, um, you know, the way business is being done and that it's more digital first. We talked, we mentioned procurement. And I think when you look at those two things together, you know, procurement has probably gotten a little bit ahead, it, you know, of of pricing and commercial teams with regards to the use of technology and the use of, you know, strategy and tactics combined with technology. And so it is this kind of like playing field that we're trying to level a bit with price optimization technology. Um, I would say though um, that you've got, um, you know, in in the in what you were talking about before, where procurement people, especially I think millennials that are in procurement roles, they don't want to deal with you know con contracting and all of this you know lengthy process necessarily. They just want to get their you know get what they need at the right price. So it really puts the onus on. I think you know suppliers to get that price right to use some of the technology that's available and to use advanced analytics, especially where they do have the transaction data to support it to just put that right price out. You know that doesn't need any approval, doesn't need a contract, and it's just like okay, because more and more companies are going to be doing that, right? I mean that's why Amazon is you know grew to 10 billion in on the B2B side in three years by doing that, right? And as you look at more and more transparency and more uh, industries that they're operating within, like they just announced that they're moving into aftermarket now, right? And so, um, you know, that's going to keep happening, whether it's Amazon or other players. And so, you know, if if companies are still trying to do this stuff in Excel or, or you know, manually, it's just, you just can't keep up with it, right? And, and especially at scale. Yeah, I, I definitely think so, you know, um, you know, Amazon's in a lot of different spaces, you know, they're office supplies, they're MRO, you know, they're, you know, purchase food company. I mean, like they're in a lot of different spaces. I think that when I think about distribution, I would say that if you would look in your own company at the areas where there's a high profit margin in certain categories, it's not that hard to ship or deliver or differentiate it and customer experience matters, those categories are prime, you know, for a digital native player to come in. 
And so I think that as I look forward, I think what I see a lot of distribution companies doing and thinking about is how do they add value to the mm-hmm. value chain? Um, a lot of distribution companies are more heavy in terms of a cost model, right? Because they've got more people, they've got, you know, often direct sales force, sometimes technical specialists, you know, you know, they have feet on the street, so to speak. Um, and so they're much heavier sales model in terms of, of cost. So the thinking is like, how do you, you know, in your value chain, add add value to your end customer that is very difficult for some digital natives to replicate without like creating an army of, you know, people or, you know, a new capability that's, you know, very outside of their core DNA, you know, mm-hmm. I would and I think that, um, you should be thinking about those kinds of things to build more of a moat around their business. Yeah. I think the other thing is that, you know, in some spaces, it's kind of, you know, already, it's already too, in some ways, already too late. Mm-hmm. And so I think there are some distributors that are thinking about like, well, are there new spaces adjacencies and things like that, new products or new offerings that I could I could get myself into that could create value for the customer where there's not this intense, you know, commoditization competition um, where I can find and, and develop new profitable growth. And so I think, you know, as I look ahead, it, the story is how do I get sharper, more efficient, more scaled, make sure the economics of running the base business is as tight as I can get it but mm-hmm. also to explore new ways of creating value for customers are my existing customers or new end markets, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's easier to do for more niche players that are like, like we have one of our clients is Watsco. They're like a $4 billion HVAC distributor. And they, they've had a lot of success on the digital commerce side. And a lot of, they made a lot of investments like in their mobile apps, you know, which at first you said, oh, well, uh, everyone has mobile. What's the big deal? But they really took a very customer centric mindset and they they went and, and developed, you know, uh, a set of capabilities for HVAC, you know, contractors that really made it easier for them and, and really illustrated that knowledge that they had of that market and, and that customer. And that that puts in that that kind of competitive mode. I think distributors that are more general and have like traditionally competed on having a wide assortment and good pricing, those are the ones where they've got to be feeling the pressure a lot of, of you know, Amazon and digital natives. But um, so I, I wonder, like, if there is like how much room there is for those types of models, you know, um, versus the more niche players that are because in order to focus on customers, you have really have to figure out, you know, what customers you're going to focus on. Right. And, and then how you're going to build that that mode. So it'll be interesting to see how things shape up here. Um, so, so you know, there there are a lot of a lot of challenges that they're facing. Uh, distributors face one of the ones that we have we talked a little bit about, but haven't really addressed squarely is uh, we talked about rebates and kind of incentives on the on the customer side. Um, but one of the things that uh, often distributors struggle with is all of the vendor allowances, vendor rebates, deviations from the vendors, and how to marry that to when they're negotiating with the customer to understand their true profitability. Um, is that something that you've had some experience with and can you talk to that and, and how, how companies can, can bring those things together and, and make them better? Yeah, I think oftentimes, you know, if you can imagine, you know, on the supply side, typically what's happening is you're negotiating pricing for the product. And so you're often, you know, getting some kind of uh, contracted price and volume based tiering that says, okay, if you buy this many widgets from us, you'll get this kind of pricing and then, you know, better pricing if you buy more widgets and then even more widgets. And I think where a lot of companies um, fall down is they don't, they're not able to connect um, what's happening on the buy side with on the sell side. So you can imagine how powerful it would be that um, if, for example, we know we're about to hit a much better volume tier from a purchasing standpoint on the supply side, um, if I'm able to sell, you know, in, in, in bring that information into the sell side of the cycle to say, hey, you know, um, let's sell these products instead of these other products because I'm about to hit this volume tier where I'm going to get a major cost break for this particular item. 
Um, and I might even be willing to reduce my price or give a temporary discount or whatever it is to increase the volume on the sales side of this particular item because of where my volume tiered rebates are happening on the supply side. I think oftentimes these systems are disconnected. I think technology could go a really long way in trying to make build that bridge and, yeah. and feed in more real-time information around when you're about to hit those tiers so that you are actually maximizing the profitability completely end to end. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I'm, I, I guess I was leading the witness a little bit on that, but that's exactly our point of view as well. And what we help help our customers do is really bring all those things together. And, and then in our, I think one of the unique things about the way that we approach price optimization and the, the AI technology that we have is the ability to actually factor in multiple objectives and constraints like that. So like, you know, not just looking at what am I going to sell for and not, not understanding that, well, if I'm, you know, $10,000 away from a, a million dollar, um, you know, revenue threshold and I get a 2% rebate out of that, that last 10,000, I, I, I could, you know, sell it at whatever I want because, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get such a, a huge reduction in my cost and, and increase in my profitability as a result. So, um, yeah, absolutely. That's something that I think is, uh, a lot of distributors have been struggling with that for a long time. And I think we're only getting to the point now where, the technology platforms are capable of actually helping them solve it. So it's it's kind of an exciting time. Let me shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, pricing teams, right? So so one of the things that you mentioned that that you did uh, was set up the pricing and revenue team at at, at Cisco and and I, I uh, you know I recently gave a talk at PPS about kind of the future of pricing teams and the future of of teams in general. And I've talked a lot about the future of pricing, but I don't want to get in my point of view. I want your your perspective on. You know, uh, first of all, you know, the process that you went through and and what you'd like to share with pricing leaders on if they are in that position where they're building, you know, either building it from scratch or building out the function or increasing, you know, the, the focus there. Uh, so let's start there and then then we can shift into like what you see is happening maybe in the future uh, around, you know, what, how those teams are going to change because of technology yeah. and because of some of these other trends we talked about. You know, I would say looking back, there were a few kind of really big key lessons learned, and I, I learned them the hard way by going through the process and <laughs> kind of trial and error. Um, but one of the things that I would say is um, in the beginning, I was really, I really wanted to hire people that had pricing experience in the industry, you mm -hmm. know. And I found it was difficult to do so because we were trying to do transformation at pricing, which you know wasn't being widely done, I think, in a lot of places. And so what I learned very quickly was that it was actually much more helpful. And the best resources I ever brought on a team were the people who were analytically inclined, who had a high EQ, you know, that in a real good commercial business general manager mindset type of person who mm -hmm. was ridiculously like ambitious and hungry for, you know, learning and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I found that if you found people with that kind of, those kind of core skill sets, like good problem solving skills, all of those kind of things that you could teach them anything you needed to teach them about the business it, it, themselves. And right. actually some of the work that they had done in other places was helpful in the way that they would think differently about some of the problems that we were trying to solve. And I think I also found that, you know, we didn't go from zero to like a hundred people overnight. This built, this, the, the organization got built out over time. And so, especially in the beginning phases, you know, what I would say was most helpful was hiring like these folks with these certain profiles because they could also be utility players because we were finding ourselves you know, working on different programs and initiatives and evolving the agenda as we were learning, you know, mm -hmm. and so having folks that had what I would call like core essential skills that you can then flex in different ways was incredibly helpful. Um, I think the other thing is that I think oftentimes um, sometimes organizations can get super um, stuck on, you know, this conversation around, well, who is it going to report to and how many people am I going to have and how many la layers and all that kind of stuff. And I think bringing to the organization a conversation like that is always kind of a little bit difficult because it's asking for an investment right in front. Um, one of the things we try to get really good about was here's the work we want to do. Here's mm -hmm. what 
it's worth. And then here's the people you're going to need and the capabilities you're going to need to support it. And like having the conversation around um, an organizational model in that order really made sense because then folks can really get their minds wrapped around, well, do we all believe this is an opportunity? Yes. Mm -hmm. We size this opportunity. I'm making these numbers up at like $50 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that there's $50 million? Check. Yes. Well, in order to do that, we're going to need to invest you know, three or five million dollars of organizational, you know, people, heads, tools, whatever it is it's going to take, we think, to do this work. And oh, by the way, you know, we're going to prove it out that there's this 50 million dollars worth of proof of concept before you know, so everybody believes in the numbers. Right. And then, then the conversation around, OK, well, now you guys need X number of heads, these kinds of tools. That's a much easier conversation to have if you've built up the proof point for what it's worth to the company. And so I would say we did not start with a, hey, you know, my name is Stephanie. I want to build out a pricing team. So <laughs> you know, here's the 20 yeah. people. Like that would have been dead, I think, on arrival. You know, it was mm -hmm. much more of a, hey, we want to build these kind of capabilities to solve these kind of problems, to generate this kind of revenue or benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll need this kind of team. And so at, as over time, we scaled the team size to match appropriately with the work that we were doing, which if you're able to deliver value to the organization, you can only imagine that year after year, you're, you will be asked to do more things to deliver right. more value to the uh, right. organization. And so we found ourselves in this space where, you know, in the beginning, it was new programs, initiatives. And then, you know, as we built those out, there was the keep the lights on, water running baseline of then keeping those programs up and alive and ensuring we were still continuing to generate value from those programs. But then there was a team that always kind of consistently did what I would call new programs experimentation to then further, like, kind of further the ag agenda and capabilities of the revenue management and pricing agenda. And so... Um, over time, you know, the organization grew and it was all ended up being a mix of capabilities of keep the lights on water running, you know, programs alive, working with the field on feedback on existing tools and programs and systems, which was really, really important in ensuring like changes that we implemented really stuck. But then a team that would experiment with how do we then take the agenda even further in terms of capabilities and all of that kind of stuff, generating new revenue streams, you know, those kinds of things that would do some of that, like test proof of concept pilot, you know, put new things in the hopper to continually increase um, the value to the organization. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let, let's talk about the future. So, so um, you know, I was uh, I was alluding to kind of this this uh, you know couple talks that I've given on the future of pricing and, and pricing teams. And I think um, you know I I kind of um, came up with this idea of the five Ds that are going to shape the future, right? So it was about being um, more distributed, right? So I mean we've seen that with the pandemic, and you know we're all working from home, and you know there's going to be lasting implications of that now that the pro you know most of the studies have actually shown that productivity has increased as a result. Right. I think I just read one that was about a 2.3 percent increase in productivity. And and that was even with juggling the additional things that we have to as parents and, and you know, homemakers, you know, as a result. Um, so the, but that distributed piece is in, it's 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 kind of forever changed, I think, to some in, in some industries. Um, the increasing level of diversity that we're seeing in the in the workforce and, and not just, you know, the traditional diversity, but also like diversity of opinions and and. Um, you yeah. know the, the the diversity of ideas, right? And and where people get their news from is all different now, and so I think that's a big deal. Um, the the digital kind of native, and we we talked about that kind of digital first mindset of and digital you know digital native uh, players in the market, but also digital native people, right? That that are you know I think you and I are you know around this in the same generation. We won't talk about about age or anything, but but I mean I think both of us have seen like you know. I mean, I, I didn't grow up in an iPad since I was two years old, like my kids, but, um, but, you know, at the same time or, or have computers until I was in, you know, high school until we started using them. Right. And we, and then, you know, in, in college started using the internet. And so I think, you know, my professional career has been pretty much digital, but my, you know, my childhood wasn't so, yeah. um, but, but, you know, you compare that to people that are kind of in, in an older generation and, and they struggle with some of these things, but like, I feel like I'm digital native because I, I actually feel like there's activation energy 
for like analog processes that I feel like is a waste, right? And I'm just like, I, and so if something's digital and I can get it done efficiently, I'll just get it done like this. But if there's something like, oh, I need to print that out and sign it and, you know, fax it in, it'll just sit on my desk, like waiting and I'll get through a hundred things digitally until I get to that one thing a lot of times. So I think that's a big deal. And then, then the, the analytical mindset, the data driven, uh, those are the last two Ds, uh, you know, so I think that's that's going to play a big role in, in shaping the future. And and so I'm just curious to get your as as you know, someone that's built teams like that and, and are talking about digital transformation and, and looking across a lot of different industries, what you see as, you know, some of those shaping forces and and what you also uh, kind of um, see in the future for, you know, for pricing teams or teams in general um, or the pricing function more more holistically. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of what you said totally resonates. I would say the other piece I would think about is I think sometimes when I see kind of the maturity journey of pricing teams in B2B, um, often it starts out more of a kind of transactional deal desk like teams, you know, um, you know, call this group and they'll do your pricing for you or call this group and they'll do some kind of, you know, more administrative in nature. Yeah. And they more and more as people understand the power of pricing and the discipline and um, the incredible value it can unlock, I see pricing having more of a commercial seat at the table and mm -hmm. more strategic seat at the table. And I think that that's a natural evolution because, I mean, if you read through you know, the differences in performance you know, in a company that thinks about pricing at the start of product offering versus like after the offer is out and then I'm going to try to do, you know, fix my prices, you know, that are already out in market. It's just, it's just magnitudes, orders of magnitude difference in, 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 um, in performance, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, and I think that um, as we think about these cross functional teams and I think the siloed functions needing to now compete more effectively, needing to be much more cross functional in, in nature, you can imagine how being in pricing and much more of a strategic role really should be working side by side with sales for sure, marketing as well, and all the promotions and how you think about those kinds of activities and finance from a value perspective to the organization. And so I see the transition of that being where, you know, maybe historically sales has been more, I mean, pricing might be more administrative in nature in terms of teams to be more strategic in nature in the companies that are trying to fire on all cylinders. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm definitely see that happening. You know, a lot of the companies that that purchase pricing software are those companies that are kind of on the leading edge of that, that, that are thinking about pricing as a, a strategic lever. Um, I remember uh, Charlie Peters uh, was at uh, at Emerson. He was the, I think the chief pricing officer or the pricing czar or something like that. He actually was on the board of Emerson, right? So that's probably the highest that it's, I've seen, but you're getting more of those like senior level, you know, pricing individuals that are really right. fostering that collaborative type of approach with the commercial teams. And, and it is a huge lever. And I think part of what we're all trying to do uh, a lot of times is to educate more and more people on this and, and hopefully uh, get an understanding in the, at the sea level that pricing is important and, you know, and that it's, it's a, it's a discipline and it's not just an art, right. And, uh, and that you can use, you know, people, process, and systems to drive dramatically improved results for, for companies, right? Yeah, I think the implication of that is the talent, you know, that you have in there. You know, I think there's a little bit, I think, sometimes of the stereotype, you know, pricing folks are very numbers. Every time I tell somebody I do pricing, they're like, oh, you're a numbers person. You know, so, <laughs> well, yeah. like, that's, that's the, you know, automatic go-to assumption. Yeah. And I think that the implications of that is kind of what I was describing in terms of like kind of the people that you think about. Yes, yeah. it definitely needs to be data driven, analytically sound, has a very logical thinking kind of mindset. But some of this knows for commercial outcomes, you know, mm -hmm. EQ and working and collaborating with these other teams become really, really critical as well to have, you know, as a part of the talent profile you have in your teams. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that learning mindset, so the commercial, you know, mindset is key, right? And thinking about not only, you know, what am I trying to do, but, you know, how am I, you know, affecting the organization and, 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 you know, we're all in having that collaboration, but yeah, that learning mindset of, okay, now I'm taking in a new, 
you can't get stuck in what you've been doing in the past, right? Because when something like the pandemic happens or even, you know, supply chain disruption in general or the tariff and trade war, you have to be able to kind of shift mindsets and say, okay, now how, how do I operate more effectively in this environment than my competitors? And how do I enable our commercial teams to, to compete, right? So I, I think those are, those are really key in, in success. Um, okay, well, I think that's about all I wanted to cover. Um, one thing I like to ask people, though, um, as we wrap up, is uh, uh, favorite blogs or or journals, uh, you know, or uh, you know, articles or books on the topics, or just in general business or pricing. Uh, be interested to get anything that you're reading or that you'd like to recommend. Um, you know, I. Uh... A couple of different thoughts. I do have a voracious appetite for learning on all kinds of different topics. Um, I think I'm fortunate at Bain, you know, we're constantly like developing new IP and writing new publications and articles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we get curated sets of like, here's all the latest kind of industry publications that are going on. And so, you know, I like to read what we we're putting out, what our competitors are putting out, you know, um, in terms of articles and learning around pricing. There's quite, there's quite a few regular, you know, players in the industry that always put out, you know, um, different pricing articles and things like that. Um, in general, I'm always kind of curious about business you know, and all those kinds of things and trends. And so um, I do, you know, watch quite a few like TED Talks and all those kinds of things. Um, I'm reading Zero to One right now. I mean, just like different books. And then um, in a more personal, like in the more personal space, you know, I'm always kind of interested in all of the things around, um, you know, self growth and actualization and all these kinds of things. So mm -hmm. um, I'm a I'm a fan of Brene Brown and some of the works that she's done. Um, I read Untamed recently, but there are all these different uh, kinds of things that I read that talks about you know personal growth and you know how mm -hmm. to your most true self that you can be. And so I'm interested in in, in those kinds of things as well. So we'll read stuff around around yeah. those topics. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing and uh, thanks for all your insight. Really enjoyed having you on. Um, anything that you'd like to add in conclusion here for the audience? No, I mean, um, I think it's, a, you know, exciting times. I think, you know, um, at times when there's a lot of pressure in certain industries, there's, you know, a real opportunity to set yourself apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that it can be done. And I think, you know, um, now more than ever, there's the right kind of tools and, you know, help that's out there to really think through and solve some of the more complex and challenging, you know, business problems. So, you know, I think, you know, staying focused and, you know, learning from other spaces is, is some of the things uh, that, that, you know, will serve companies well as they think about the future. I agree. Well, thanks so much for your time. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Pricing Matters.